Hey, Conspirituality listeners. I wanted to do a, one of these that I haven't done in a while, which is more of a sort of philosophical riff. And I'm inspired by having just created a bonus episode, an unusual kind of bonus episode with Matthew. We collaborated on something that's going to drop this Monday. We thought it might be useful and fun to do a kind of productive, good faith conversation about where we disagree because there are differences we have that are sort of philosophical, uh, political, even though we're both fundamentally progressive liberals, there are some differences there. And we wanted to enter into it in terms of thinking about loaded language and how in our very polarized and sort of overcharged, uh, especially online discourse, there are ways in which we shut down to one another based on language cues, based on what we perceive as dog whistles or coded words or the use of terminology that we associate with a whole set of demonized or beliefs or intentions or affiliations that the person we're talking to may or may not have, right? We don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. And so we thought it'd be interesting to just sort of unpack some of that stuff. And I'm excited to share that with you on Monday. Now, at the same time, this week, on Thursday, Derek interviewed Alex Ebert of Edward Sharp and Magnetic Zeros. And that, that's already available since uh, last night, so go listen to the, the new episode uh, on the website or wherever you listen to podcasts. And I also happen to have interviewed someone named Amanda Montel, who is the author of a new book called Cultish. She's a linguist, and she's looking at cults in a very broad sense through the lens of language. And both of them happen to have referenced Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote uh, The Power of Positive Thinking and who was Trump's pastor when he was growing up, and how that way of thinking about language and thinking about the power of the mind to influence reality obviously played a, a significant role in the shaping of uh, Trump's personality, Trump, maybe his belief system, certainly the way he interacted with reality as a president. So here's the quote that, uh, that Alex Ebert gives. The powerful and positive thought can overcome the fact completely. Something like that. I may be paraphrasing. And the powerful and positive thought can overcome the fact completely. And so Peel is often credited with, uh, he, he's one of the central figures in what was called the New Thought Movement. This is linked to prosperity gospel, it's linked to science of mind and Christian science. If you're here in LA, it's linked to agape and the secret and Abraham Hicks, right? It all, it all sort of comes from a similar place. What we think of as the New Age ideology or the general sort of New Age worldview, even though it's very eclectic, has its roots in this kind of New Thought stuff in Christian science, science of mind, um, in the Theosophical Society and their sort of, and the previous Orientalism and fetishizing of Eastern mysticism, but how that then intersects with occult and Western uh, mysticism that, that was around at the same time. All of these early influences, this is the soil that New Age beliefs sort of grow up out of, and I would contend that that then becomes the soil that the phenomenon we call conspirituality comes up out of. And so why is this significant in terms of the conversation I just recorded yesterday with Matthew? Well, we talked about this term postmodernism, and I wanted to make it very clear that when I am critical of postmodernism, not necessarily being critical of an accurate understanding of what people like Derrida and Lyotard and Foucault and, uh, and Baudrillard, like, like what all of these French intellectuals were saying, because obviously it's quite sophisticated and it's quite dense and it's fairly idiosyncratic in terms of how they use language to talk about how language uh, obscures our, ac our direct access to reality and how the context within which ideas uh, emerge has all of these sort of language coded constraints upon it or filters upon it that that then uh, drive our perception but also how all of this is situated within networks of power and, and power and influence so so this stuff is it's an important aspect of critical thinking 
with regard to something like in spirituality, and I, and I definitely concede that. But where I have issues with postmodernism is the way that it has been used, the way it has been co-opted and, and probably misunderstood. I'm not enough of an expert on it to be able to, to fully unpack how, but I have my own hunches about it, right? And so what do I mean specifically? The idea that thoughts create reality, the idea that a kind of NLP idea that how you use language will, will, will frame your state of mind and that will then frame what does or doesn't happen in your life, right? And again, that may be a gross misapplication or misunderstanding, but that's how it's taken in the new age. The intersection with philosophical positions, like in philosophical terms, idealism, the idea that mind is everything, that consciousness is primary to reality. Uh, the idea that, that is in there somewhere philosophically of anti-realism as opposed to realism, right? Realism in, in its most basic sense would say there is a real world out there to be discovered. There are facts. Uh, we can use th the tools of science and reason to get closer to, to knowing what the facts are and to being able to adequately describe reality, not in some ultimate metaphysical sense, but in a sense that matters in terms of our lives as human beings, right? We can do that better using science and reason and evidence and, and the consensus uh, ways in which we explore those things, which are called philosophy and, and peer review and, and uh, you know, that, those, those sorts of things. So realism says those things. Anti-realism is related then to what I call freshman skepticism, to, uh, to solipsism, to, and, and to these uh, foundational influences on New Age philosophy, so or, or New Age ideology. I don't, I don't even know that calling it philosophy. We should, we should dignify it that much because it's not really a philosophy. Um, popular New Age ideas, right? And and what I mean by that is, there, there. If if we draw a line and we say on this side of the line are ideas and beliefs and thinkers that essentially say there is such a thing as reality, there are facts, there are ways that we can show things to be false, uh, even though we don't know everything because that's an, that's an impossible standard. Um, the, the progress of science has, has shown us things about the world, some of which are, are true every single time we ever test them and it would be highly, highly unlikely that it ever turn out not to be true, even though new discoveries happen all the time and even though the appropriate uh, Science-informed way of looking at things is to say all truth statements are provisional, they're subject to change based on new data. That's already built in, right? So there are people on this side of the equation who value reason, value scientific method, uh, value a kind of consensus, good faith way of trying to find out what the facts are uh, based on logic and reason and evidence, right? And on the other side of this line that I've drawn, there are people who insist on anti-realism, idealism, thought creates reality, there's no way of really knowing. And the unfortunate truth is that certain ideas from postmodernism, things like radical social constructionism, things like radical relativism, extreme relativism, uh, things like there not being any way of really knowing what is true outside of your specific context, your specific language game, your specific uh, perspective, your standpoint on reality. You can never get outside of that, right? While I understand the limited ways that these are actually very profound observations that help us to think about reality in more insightful ways, perhaps in ways that are more culturally sensitive, perhaps in ways that are less uh, epistemically arrogant, right? There, there's, there's value there. What people on this side of the line do is they, they take those kinds of concepts and co-opt them into just like magical thinking, into thought creates reality, into whatever I believe is actually true, into the, the, what uh, Alex Ebert is saying Trump was doing, and Amanda Montel says it as well, uh, in terms of the influence of that kind of language. Not to shape reality itself, but to shape how someone thinks about and interacts with reality, and that's a very big distinction, right? There's a big distinction between I choose to believe this thing because it makes me feel better, because maybe it does make you feel better. And maybe it makes people like you more sometimes, right? But whether or not it affects 
the nature of reality, how things happen. If you're immune to COVID, whether or not you need a vaccine, whether or not masks actually work, whether or not there are victims in the world who are, who are oppressed or, or traumatized, right, violated, that, that's a different question. And that question, these people are better at addressing. And this to me is where psychology comes in because for me, a psychologically informed kind of awareness or, or philosoph uh, ph philosophy of the world says that we have to come to terms with the vulnerable truths of our emotional existence if we are to be honest, existentially honest, right? And, and that to me, that's in the realm of psychology, that's in the realm of learning how to deal with difficult emotions, that's in the realm of facing trauma, and I would argue things like oppression, uh, injustice, unfairness, the fact that bad things do happen to good people regardless of what their belief system is, right? That to me is on this side of the line. So those lines actually are, are fairly distinct for me. There's, there's, some, there's some bleed over maybe, there's some gray area, but, but the line actually does define two really identifiable camps. And the camp that to me is prone to spiritual bypass and delusional beliefs and magical thinking and science denial and uh, I don't know, solipsism, narcissism, the, everything that characterizes what we criticize in terms of conspirituality, they're on this side of the line. And if they are educated, they will tend to use various misappropriated postmodern ideas to justify their science denial. And in fact, they'll even do it in a very um, kind of social justice informed seeming political way. Right, where they'll say, well, you can't, uh, you, you are out of bounds to critique magical thinking or paranormal claims or supernaturalism, um, even though you're talking about how maybe conspiracists are doing this in a dangerous way, right? Maybe conspiracists are saying, well, I went to uh, 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 some country to... around the Amazon and I, and I did ayahuasca and I was told by the plant medicine, right? that spoke to me that these things are true about COVID and about the cabal and about the, the aliens and you know on and on, microchips. Uh, even though you're, criti you're critiquing that, you can only do it if the person who is making those claims is Western and they're culturally appropriating and so therefore they're, they're doing an inauthentic version of whatever this tradition is. And while I understand that, I, I get the, the, the cultural sensitivity piece around that, and I get the importance of not punching down and, and the desire to, to be mindful about that sort of thing. There's another level in terms of how you look at the world from this perspective that says it doesn't matter who's making the claim. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's someone who's indigenous to that culture or someone who's a spiritual tourist, if they're saying things that are demonstrably untrue using the tools of science and reason, those things apply no matter what. That's, that's the huge breakthrough. And this is where we get to enlightenment values, right? right? That the, the huge breakthrough in terms of human knowledge, human consciousness, human societies, that scientific method and reason represents, it's not just some arrogant power grab. It is a powerful breakthrough into, oh, there are ways of finding out what's true regardless of who is looking. There are ways of getting as close to truth as we possibly can that, especially if we do it in a, in a way that is, is um, you know, self-critical and has, has a, a dialogical kind of peer review component to it and is trying to be open and transparent uh, and as free from corruption as possible, because all those things are still there too, right? And we have to contend with them. But if we're doing it well, we do much better at finding out what's true. And there's a way that what is true philosophically is fundamentally intertwined with questions of what is good and what is beautiful. That, that the, what happens with the Enlightenment, and, and I'm always quick to, to say to people, you know, the Enlightenment and colonialism are not the same thing. Colonialism started a long time before the Enlightenment, and the events of the Enlightenment and, and the, the sort of principles of the Enlightenment that started to give rise to democracy, that started to give rise to separation of church and state, that started to give rise to the end of theocracy 
and, and the beginnings of democracy and, and, and ideals of freedom that have imperfectly been applied and are still in a process of evolving, all of that led to the dismantling of colonialism. It was one of the factors, right, from within these societies, led to the civil rights movement, led to the ways in which we continuously in liberal democracies keep hitting these new thresholds of saying, oh, we have to hold ourselves to these standards, these ideals that have been imperfectly applied, that were applied with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, bias and, and uh, a sort of unconsciousness about horrifically oppressive realities that were still present, that were part of the consciousness, even of those idealists from that time, right? The Founding Fathers were not perfect. They were, they were products of their time. But, but all of that stuff that was happening in France and in England and, and in the United States during that period, it has led to this intersection of science and reason and democracy and capitalism, which we can critique in really important ways. But all of that stands as distinct from countries that still have theocracy. And there are quite a few on the planet today. And guess what? The countries that still have theocracy well, they tend, to, they tend to want to execute gays, and they tend to want to execute atheists, and they tend to have very, very uh, poor standards of equality and freedom for women, and some of them still have slaves. So there's, you know, it's, the world is so complex in terms of how these different threads have evolved, uh, and one of the things we talked about in the conversation too is how being from a post-colonial society myself, being from South Africa, being in South Africa during the Cold War, knowing that in a post-World War II uh, historical period, talking about like from, from the late 40s to the early 90s, what was going on with, or 91 to be more accurate, what was going on with the Cold War is that the Soviet Union was asserting itself in all of these different post-colonial countries and empowering the people who deserved to be empowered empowering the very people who are fighting for their freedom and their equality. But they were being armed and fed an ideology that came from the Soviet Union. And as much as we might have issues with capitalism, I think we do ourselves a grave disservice if we don't acknowledge that what happened in the 20th century is we ran a very big real-time experiment on the difference between, uh, say, a capitalist democracy and a uh, uh, communist or Marxist uh, states, and one side won, and the other, for the other side it went absolutely terribly. That the, the application of the most idealistic Marxist philosophy and, uh, and, and what went down in those authoritarian communist regimes, was it just, it just didn't work. It really failed. And at the end of the 20th century, I think what we really see is that the countries that have been able to foster some kind of third way, it's often called, synthesis between a, a strong social safety net and the government having enough control and influence over aspects of the society that are for the good of all people and a robust capitalist economy and real democratic freedoms as tracing directly from the Enlightenment period, these are the cultures who have done best. And of course, the world is still a mess. And of course, you can make all kinds of critiques of capitalism and imperialism and American power. And what I was saying about the Cold War period applies, right? Because the United States was on the side of a lot of right-wing dictatorships during the Cold War throughout Africa and South America and Asia because they were fighting against the Soviets. And that sucks. But it doesn't mean that the Soviets weren't a real threat. It doesn't mean that the Soviets didn't, didn't create, you know, the Soviets and the, and the, the Chinese communists and, and what was going on in Cuba, that all of that wasn't just an absolute atrocious tragedy for, for the people in those cultures. So, so that's going off in a lot of different directions that to me are intimately connected and as I reflect have, have very much shaped my worldview. Um, and that dividing line makes a lot of sense to me. And so here's what I want to say. I think that one can be simultaneously acknowledging of the social constructs of certain aspects 
of reality whilst also acknowledging that underneath that there are facts there are things that we know through scientific evidence there are things that are logical and that make reasonable sense that are true no matter who is looking and whatever your belief system is and whatever culture you come from and whatever uh, your perspective might be that's all well and good and to a certain extent i think it's valid to be culturally sensitive about that but it doesn't change the fact that there are facts that doesn't change the realities of science right covid covid 19 has devastated uh every country it has gone into regardless of their belief system yeah it, it doesn't care it doesn't care about your metaphysics right it doesn't care what you think about science it doesn't care what you think of it doesn't care if you think that your particular religious uh belief will protect you from it it still did what it did and that's what that's what Alex was referencing actually in the in the interview um, about how this particular new age idealism in the philosophical sense that believes that your thoughts can can shape the reality you experience it gets decimated by something like this that's that's just the fact so I tend to be either outright dismissive or suspicious and cautious around stuff from this side of the line and especially when it undermines stuff on this side of the line that I'm pretty confident is true no matter what.